This week, we were lucky enough to be invited to the first ever UK press screening of the brand new tabletop themed comedy action movie Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves. We have gathered our biggest DD fan and our biggest DD hater to give their honest impressions of the film as tabletop experts and critics. Let's meet our reviewers. Hello, I'm Wheels. I'm the head of video here at Dicebreaker. I've been playing tabletop RPGs for about a decade and a half, and I am a D&D &D hater. Hi there, I'm Olivia Kennedy, Dicebreaker video producer, consumer of the best and worst media, utter nerd, and I am a D&D &D lover. Thank you. Though I love d and I went into this screening with pretty high expectations. I might even end up being harsher than wheels, so let's jump in and see. Hater's a bit of a strong word, but I'm definitely not like very into d and I don't really like playing it all that much. I would say I'm definitely not the target market for this film either. I'm not super into big action blockbuster MCU style films. Like my favorite film from the last year was Banshees of Inisherin which is pretty much the polar opposite of this, but I'm very much gonna try and meet the film at its own level. So our film follows Edgin the Bard and his best mate Holger the Barbarian, played by Chris Pine and Michelle Rodriguez, respectively. They're like freshly broken out of prison after a sentence served for a heist gone wrong, and now they're like assembling a team of anti-heroes to complete an even bigger heist against some old friends which have now turned into enemies. Most of the film is taken up with the preparation stages for their big score, finding some legendary loot that can help them bypass the impassable defenses of their target, convincing people to join their cause, and hatching more and more elaborate schemes when things don't go as planned. If you've seen Guardians of the Galaxy, then it feels very much inspired by that. Uh, it's an absolutely blistering pace. I could feel the writers and producers trying to cram as many recognizable D&D locales and creatures and spells as possible. We go from like Icewind Dale to Neverwinter to the Underdark. There's about 15 different monster manual creatures like crammed in there. They kind of just randomly acquire powerful items at times. Whether you love D&D or hate it, someone is going to say that this plot is either too much or too little. With the fact that they had around 200 minutes to encapsulate everything D&D &D into this film, I think they did the best they could with what they had. I think the film probably suffered for it in the end. There's definitely aspects of the like narrative and certain character arcs that are really rushed to try and make space for it all in the like, two hour-ish, I think, runtime. The classic bit of like, our heroes are at their lowest point and they must come together against adversity to complete the third act. That bit like turns up and leaves in like three minutes of screen time because they are just desperately trying to get through stuff. The plot has a lot crammed into it. A daring escape, betrayal, assembling a team, a heist, and even a segment that felt extremely Hunger Games to me. The final confrontation was actually something of an afterthought, which they played off nicely, but it just shows how much they had to do in a limited time. I was happy with it though. I saw a lot of things that I wanted to. Simple things like taking a long rest, the manifestation of attunement, a climactic battle that was pretty exciting for the most part, but then kind of went out with a trickle as opposed to a boom. The biggest problem I had with a lot of the plot beats is how coincidental they felt. These like super powerful tools will just like fall into the hands of the cast. Someone just like happens to know where a legendary artifact might be buried and their mate is a powerful paladin who can help them get it. It seems like quite a lot of the decisions in the script writing process were in service of moving the plot forward rather than keeping it all coherent. A lot of moments seem like a bit of a like deus ex machina and sometimes the film can even break the rules that it's set up in previous beats in aid of moving the heroes from one place to another. So it was a little bit inconsistent at times. There were also a lot of moments that made me laugh out loud along with the rest of the audience. I think I finally understood the sense of fun and excitement that Marvel fans have when Iron Man makes yet another funny quip. Though that doesn't interest me all that much, I do like it when Chris Pine does it. <laughs> as long as you go into this film with an open mind and some kind of love for D&D, &D, you're going to enjoy it. Outside of that, it's nothing like super original. There's no real reinvention of the wheel, but I don't think anyone expected that there would have been. Like, I'm glad that they went with a sort of reluctant hero angle. That feels the most appropriate for how most people, I think, play D&D. &D. But yeah, it's your standard heist movie framework of like putting all the bits together and trying to make it work. But oh no, this thing's gone wrong. So we need to improvise and we'll all become good friends by the end and save the day. 
All right, immediately, I have one complaint about the cast of characters, and that is that they are way too normal. If you're gonna tell me that this, put a, put a picture of the tiefling up here, that this is a tiefling? No, 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 no. I have to start off in agreement with wheels. This is not a tiefling. <laughs> It just felt like an odd choice to include such a cool species and not fully commit to it. It's not like the budget wouldn't allow for that. I feel like they were worried about making their character too devilish and therefore scaring off the family crowd. But there's a balance that could have been achieved here that really wasn't. The main characters were all way too like humanoid. All the fun species that you can play as, mostly reserved to like cameos and extra roles. They start off strong because you've got like a dragonborn and an arrow. Ara, the bird one, in proper like speaking roles affecting the plot. But from then on, everyone's just like a human or a human with elf ears stuck on, and that sucks. Tieflings are such an iconic D&D thing. I think you'd be hard pressed to find a party of players that don't have one in them. And Doric, I think her name was, played by Sophia Lillis from It, was just like a human, but she had some like piddly little horns on and then this thin little nothing tail that they spend most of the film like hiding from view. It's awful. Like I referenced Guardians of the Galaxy earlier. Look at their main cast. You've got like a tree person, a green alien woman and a raccoon. Like that feels way more like an actual D&D party, or at least the ones that I've seen. I know that Sophia Lillis is an excellent actress. If you've seen her in It or in I'm Not Okay With This, which I'm still not over the cancellation of, you'll know that she nailed her roles in both of those, and so I think they used her character as more of a plot device than a character. She mentions her backstory very briefly, and I wanted to know more about that, but in a bit more of a show-don't-tell way. Doric definitely had the least going for her, like, character-wise as well. Like, she's got, like, a pretty forced romance plot with one of the other crew members and has a very minor arc with her, like, distrust of outsiders that barely gets, like, a whiff of development. She felt a bit more like a tool than a character. Like, she's very useful plot-wise because she's good at casting Wild Shape, which allows her to turn into different animals at will, but that's like effectively all she does in the film outside of being a bit snippy towards the protagonist. Lilith's performance just isn't all that exciting either, but it could just be a case of not a whole lot to work with, which I don't really think is her fault. She and Justice Smith do have a little romance thing going on, which wasn't super well done. <laughs> All I'm asking for is more of a dedicated build-up as opposed to the plot just telling us they're together. Honestly, as a tiefling main myself, <laughs> I wanted Doric to be my favourite character. But alas, that award goes to... Holger, played by Michelle Rodriguez, is a kick-ass barbarian who doesn't take BS from anyone and is a total shimbo and I'm a simple woman and I love that. They strike a wonderful balance with her. She's terrifying and can take on five enemies at once, but she's also maternal and nurturing and is a lover who has a thing for pocket-sized men. <laughs> the film wants you to fall in love with this strong and loyal protector, but I'm not afraid to say that I fell for that trap. It's also lovely to see her and Chris Pine's characters so closely bonded, but I do feel like she exists for his character and not alongside his character, if that makes sense. I thought Chris Pine and Michelle Rodriguez did a really good job with their leading roles, although it, as it will become a bit of a theme with the things I'm about to say, their dynamic feels borrowed almost like completely wholesale from Geralt and Jaskier from the Witcher TV show. Chris Pine's Edgin is the kind of edgy bard who we've all played. He even dresses similarly to my edgy bard, but at least she's a water ganassi. Chris Pine as a water ganassi would have been huge. Edgin is the main character and that is a shame. One of the main draws of playing D&D is that everyone is the main character. The story revolves around him and his journey and getting back what he lost. However, he's got the perfect glossy veneer to him that screams bard, and Pine delivers that very well. You also have Reggie Jean Page as the NPC who joins the party for a few sessions. But really, he plays the stalwart paladin with a very strict moral code who acts as a guide for the group allowing them to venture into dangerous territory with a sort of shield. Reggie Jean Page's stoic and heroic paladin feels very inspired by Drax from, again, Guardians of the Galaxy, with that whole, I take everything at face value and like, I don't understand common phrases kind of shtick. Reggie Jean Page isn't quite as main a character as the marketing materials would have you believe, by the way. He's more of a like guiding NPC than part of their initial crew. I have to say, for me, he was extremely entertaining, both in terms of the battles he was a part of and in terms of his straight edge paladin way of, of being. 
It takes the mick out of those kind of characters, and I'm glad it was included. You've also got Justice Smith, who plays a sort of like spineless sorcerer trying to find his own backbone. He's sort of the butt of the joke for most of the film and has a bit more of an actual arc in overcoming his own lack of self-confidence. But again, we don't really get much time to sit with it because the movie's just blitzing past every scene to get to the next big set piece. Simon the Sorcerer? Yeah, really. <laughs> it's played by Justice Smith, who I have loved since the get down, once again unceremoniously cancelled by Netflix. It's nice to see him in more of a bumbling comedy relief character here. I haven't seen him in that kind of role, and he does a great job. I like that he's a sorcerer from a family of wizards who needs to learn to accept himself for who he is before he can find his power. That's a fun character arc that we've probably seen at our tables. However, there's one moment in particular with him where he overcomes the issues holding him back that made me go... Uh, mm. His spells add a lot of interesting visuals to the film that we'll go into more later on. Also, his English accent is a little bit wobbly, which I'm sure like the US audience won't really pick up on, but it took me out of the scene a couple of times, which is weird because so many of the actors just stick with their own American accent, so I don't really know why he did a British one, but I appreciate the effort, I guess. Hugh Grant is... God, there's so many people in this film. Um, <laughs> Hugh Grant is basically playing his Paddington 2 character again, but like a bit more conniving. I can't really complain, because like, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it didn't feel quite as well written as the Paddington offering did. Um, there is like a lot of fun sort of scenes with him. He's having a good time, though. You know, like it makes sense for his character. Is Hugh Grant an adventurer? Does he have a class? It's implied that maybe he does? Uh, they call Forge a con man, so maybe he's a kind of bard too? Regardless of that, he's a highlight in the movie. He's a delightfully foppish adversary for the team, who is definitely an NPC I've met and never truly trusted while playing. His face flies up in the sky a lot, which made me laugh a lot. And then lastly, as far as like the main cast goes, you've got Daisy Head playing the big bad evil wizard behind everything. You might recognise Head from her bit part in the Sandman's Diner episode. That, yep, that episode. Her main contribution to the film is kind of just like standing around with her eyes really peeled wide open and looking spooky. And it's it's not really anything to write home about, to be honest. As far as villains go, there is like no nuance with the character whatsoever. You get a brief glimpse at something maybe controlling her from the background, which I assume is just sort of hinting at other films to come because... It's literally all we hear about it. But she's just she's just the big bad evil person and that's about it. Daisy Head plays the antagonist orchestrating everything and I won't give anything away, but her motivation to do this was displayed in a way that made sense in the world of D&D, but unfortunately just felt like a lazy narrative decision because it wasn't fleshed out enough. She was very one dimensional, but the fact that an obviously evil woman was just accepted by those around her was very funny. <laughs> So this is definitely the most grating part of the film. If you're also very sick of what I can only describe as like the marvelification of film dialogue, then Honor Among Thieves is maybe not for you. Characters kind of flip back and forth between action dialogue and witty quip with like almost like surgical precision. The most frustrating part of it being that almost all of the jokes ended up falling flat for me because the characters just couldn't help themselves and would say the punchline out loud. Like there'd be some really funny visual gag or physical comedy that deserved to stand on its own two legs. And then like clockwork, one of the main four will just outright say the thing out loud. Like there's like a, well that just happened like every five seconds. And it was really weighing down on me by the end of the film, which sucks because I, I thought a lot of the comedy was good without it. The writing was very fast paced, very quippy and a lot of fun. However, I do think, as we just mentioned, some characters were prioritized over others. Thinking about it now, the three characters written quite poorly were all women. <laughs> I enjoyed Holger's writing, but it was a bit buff lady smash. Dialogue from Holger, Doric, and the red wizard lady was definitely lacking. There are like so many examples of badass female characters in D&D. Where are the Vexalis, the Moonshine Cybins, the Iris Walkers? You get what I mean, right? <laughs> I don't know about everyone else, but I genuinely feel like a little bit taught down to when movies have to explain their jokes to me. Like I couldn't understand it myself without it being like, I don't know, pre-masticated and shoved down my throat like I'm a little baby bird. That's a weird metaphor. I just, I fully admit that like your mileage may vary with this. Like there were a lot of people having a good time, laughing it up around me uh, as I was like putting my head in my hands for the fifth time in a row. I could well just be like a grumpy bastard. 
Like, as I've said, I'm not the target market by any means. But if you're as bored of this stuff as I am, like, maybe give it a miss because there's a lot of it. Like, it is wall to wall. You had Edgin's family issues, Simon's acceptance of his power, and a whole backstory sequence for our NPC paladin. But aside from Holger's brief conversation with someone from her past, it was all a bit one-sided. Once again, I know there's only an, a finite amount of time to fit these things in, but the characters are the essence of D&D, and the fact that they were allowed to fall flat didn't sit well with me. Or Among Thieves does have like some really competent comedy chops when it allows itself to. There's a fun montage with the Speak With Dead spell that's been teased in a public trailer that was genuinely really enjoyable, like I had a really good time watching it. Hugh Grant's character has some really silly visual gags throughout that get like a nice payoff at the end as well that I'm not going to spoil here. Um, I just wish they'd have enough confidence in their audience and in their own like writing skills to just let the jokes exist on their own merits rather than having to like, hey guys, did you, did you see that? Did you see what we did? Aren't we wacky? I think a lot of that kind of character dedication was given up in the place of broad appeal. Of course, E1 wants this to appeal to everyone, not just D&D players, and you can see that from the trailers prioritizing the comedy value of it over a more serious approach to things like Lord of the Rings would, for example. Would I have loved to see something a little more gritty, with the stakes a little higher, and some incredible character moments sprinkled in? Absolutely. Maybe this is something we'll get in a sequel. It seems like one would be possible with the way the film ended, and we can only hope. One thing I did really appreciate is how little the film like looks down on its own source material. I think D&D and its fans never felt like the butt of the joke. There's like a, a reverence for the game that manages to find the difficult balance between being like self-aware and not dumping on the thing that you're trying to celebrate, and also being careful not to like hero worship the brand too much like you might see in like i don't know like a star wars film for example nothing in the film felt like it was you know i demanded to care about it simply because it existed but when the script poked a little fun at DD, i also never felt like the real life players were being like mocked as a result which is you know it's a tricky balance to strike and i think they did really well there is some stuff that i wish had been left on the cutting room floor um the film opens with a sort of setup to our main two with Egin like minding his own business, knitting mittens, and then Holger looking like strong and menacing in their jail cell. They obviously wanted to set Holger up as this like badass female barbarian who doesn't take prisoners. And the way they do that is they immediately have a big horrible orc threaten her with sexual assault, which is not great. Uh, I didn't really appreciate that, so not not good. There's also just a lot of scenes like just taking up runtime that basically amount to one of the characters getting to like show how cool and good at fighting they are as, as they like effortlessly dispatch a huge group of soldiers. And yeah, like it's an action film. So, you know, but it, it definitely removed a lot of the tension from the film for me when you see how little these characters need to care about the consequences of getting caught because they're they're kind of superheroes. I guess that's a bit of a D&D &D problem in general rather than just the films, but it would have been nice to see the characters express a little bit of weakness and peril and make me care about them and worry about them a little bit more. Um, but for the most part, it was just kind of, oh yeah, well, eight dudes. I wonder how they're, oh, they're all dead. Okay, cool. There were some phenomenally done visual and practical effects in this film, and I think it might have been one of the biggest highlights for me. I have to give the film its dues and say that for the most part it does look fantastic. The visual effects were really stunning at times, and the CGI is really well rendered and not overused. I was really pleasantly surprised at the amount of practical effects used, even if some of them were a little bit clumsy. The scenes with the D&D creatures really went hard. You had dragons, displacer beasts, mimics, and they were all kind of terrifying, which is exactly what I wanted to see. Being an adventurer is a dangerous job, and what they all came up against really show that off. There's a dragonborn right at the start that looks really excellent. Um, the costumes are to like a really high standard. The shows you can have normal looking armor in fantasy settings without some stupid, like, hint, hint, Witcher, what the Nilf Guardians, what the, they wearing, you know? But a lot of the film was shot on location in the UK and Ireland, and it really shows. You've got, like, some gorgeous interior shots in Neverwinter. 
that I think definitely were repurposed British cathedrals, or at least that's what they look like to me, um, and some really lovely like, natural landscapes as well. There is one scene in particular that comes to mind that I really enjoyed, in which Doric wild shapes several times in order to escape from peril. Despite Doric not being exceptionally well written, she is a very capable druid. Perhaps a bit too capable with all the sheer amount of wild shapes she did in one sitting, but I digress. The visual effects seamlessly capture her as she transforms into a menagerie's worth of different animals, scurrying, flying, and cantering her way out of the clutches of the bad guys. When I saw it, I thought, this is the exact kind of thing I wanted to see. A real showcase of what different classes can do. And of course there's like a fun visual gag right at the end that is immediately spoiled by a character explaining the joke and saying, hey guys, remember when I said that? When, before the montage started? And I was like, yeah, okay, all right, cool. Speaking of practical effects, um, the tabaxis, which are basically like the cat furries of the D&D world, uh, they only appear for like a few brief moments as background characters but ooh, they look bad. <laughs> Furries is appropriate, I think, because I've seen way more convincing fursuits on Twitter than were in the film. The film was directed by what I can tell were like a relatively rookie directorial duo in, I think it's John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein, who are more well known for their screenwriting credits, which actually include Marvel's Spider-Man Homecoming. So that's kind of interesting. This time around, they were both writing and directing and I was watching, like I could feel the pressure of newer directors trying to impress with loads of like really flashy transitions and an oddly reoccurring theme of upside down shots that were honestly a little bit too much I felt. And they were really out of place at times. You, you never really want your cinematography to pull the viewer out of the experience. And for me, it definitely did. Just a bit, you know, less is more, I think would have been better. The spells were also fantastic to see. You could almost immediately tell which spell was which without putting much thought into it. And it was really fascinating for a huge D&D nerd like me. Even if there were spells that were flavored a little differently, you could tell what they were going for. Whether it was Big Bee's hand, made out of stone or a twist on Hunger of Hadar, it made me want to see more so I could just ogle the way they manifest. However, Simon losing concentration on major illusion will haunt me for the rest of my days. You'll understand what I mean when I, when you see it. You'll you'll understand. Final note on the visuals: the film is weirdly full of body horror. I guess that comes with the territory, but I assume the target demographic for this would skew a lot younger than it felt like the film was written for. Maybe that's on me. Um, but if you're planning on bringing your kids to this. There's like a few swears and some genuinely like quite disturbing imagery that had our audience really like grossing out in response. But then at the same time, there were people getting like fully beheaded and stabbed the crap out of swords without like a single drop of blood showing up anywhere at all, which is a bit odd. I, d I don't really know where the like the bar was, but there you go. It's not all sunshine and rainbows, by the way, for me, because I do have a few complaints. The tabaxi. The tabaxi looked like people wearing poorly made fursuits. I'm not even going to apologize for this one. They look bad. It's like they used up the majority of their budget on the Dragonborn and a little bit of what was left on the Aarakocra and then just asked a mate if they could borrow a fursuit and then made a little tabaxi baby doll. Like, I, it was a little jarring to say the least. Justice for the tabaxi. So I think this section is probably going to be a bit more on live than me because despite me having played a lot of D&D over the course of like my tabletop obsession over the years, I'm not super into the lore and I don't know every rule and spell and monster off by heart. I will say that it did feel relatively faithful to the subject matter for me. It's maybe more of a good representation of what people see playing D&D as rather than what playing D&D actually is. But considering it's made by like a publishing company owned by Hasbro, I wouldn't say that I'm shocked at it being more of an advert for the game than, you know, like an honest portrayal. They did try and cram as like many references in as physically possible. Ian from Eurogamer, who was sat next to me, even spotted like a group of adventurers in the background of one scene that were fully decked out in the costumes from the original animated movie that I have not seen because I am not old, sorry. But yeah, the, like there's all the like classic monsters from owlbears to mimics and of course a dragon. There's like a wide variety of spells and magical items that actually exist in the game and work how they should. Uh, it's well researched, like I have to give it to give it to them, you know, like they even say like, oh, what's the range on that? Oh, I can do 500 feet, you know, all that kind of stuff. I could go on forever about this, but here are a few things that stood out for me. I love a bard, and so I did notice a lot about Edgin. 
First of all, I have to say that he didn't seem to have any bard spells. That was such a shame. He definitely sang a bunch and played his lute quite a lot, but no spells. I was so desperate to see him play a ditty and then shatter a wall to get them out of a jam or maybe distract with a hypnotic pattern or two, but there was nothing. There were a few points where he definitely used bardic inspiration. For example, if Holger was busy cracking skulls, his words of encouragement were funny, but we also know that he was actually helping out in his own way. I also really enjoyed the fact that he would do a lot of the talking, even going so far as asking anyone else if they had something to add, and then just leaving him to it because he's the bard. <laughs> You know there were a few moments in which I could imagine they made roles and either succeeded or failed, like one of them triggering the collapse of a bridge, or them successfully pulling off a heist that would have been very far-fetched in actuality. In those circumstances, it also felt like a dungeon master was preventing them from progressing too far, pulling the strings behind the scenes. The fight scenes were cool to look at. Holger kicked so much ass. It was beautiful. However, a lot of it was one person against a lot of opponents, which served to show off their power, but I was hoping for more fights with the whole party involved. We did get a bit of that towards the end, but some more wouldn't have hurt. We got to see an interesting translation of attuning to a magical item. One that tweaked the rules of attunement a bit for the sake of the plot, but it was great to see that aspect of gameplay mentioned. As I mentioned earlier, Doric's wild shape scene was extremely dope, but being the nerd that I am, it did strike me that it was a lot of wild shapes in a short space of time. She would have had to be a circle of the moon druid for sure, and a high level one at that. In fact, thinking about it, she would need to be a level 20 druid, allowing her to wild shape an unlimited number of times. I don't think she was. And if she was, she was holding a lot back on the team. Also, I think this is more of a question than a concrete statement, but the Red Wizard's Blade, is it like an unbeatable item that insta-kills anyone it hits? That seems slightly overpowered. Just let us know in the comments below if you know a bit more on this than we do, and I doubt you'll miss this in the film. Seriously, I don't want to drag this video out longer than it already is, but I'll just say that the D&D vibes were definitely there, even if they did skew the rules just a little bit. In the end, Honor Among Thieves is a film that doesn't outsay its welcome, it delivers about what you want it to, and it has fun doing it, you know? But ultimately, I, I don't think I'd ever really think about it again after watching, if it wasn't my job to, anyway. It doesn't really do anything original or all that interesting and subversive, despite the sheer amount of stuff they just crammed into its runtime. Uh, and I can't really name anything that sets it apart from the rest of the big budget blockbusters that are sure to come out this year and the next apart from it maybe being fantasy, but yeah, it felt a lot like a Marvel film. The real takeaway is that this was definitely just the first morsel of an entire smorgasbord of D&D cinematic universe releases that they're testing the waters with. Setting up locales and characters and establishing their like, tone and visual style, It's more. it felt more like a proof of concept than anything. But if you're a big D&D fan or you just want to see a dumb action blockbuster, then this will provide like more than enough entertainment for an evening. Um, just maybe don't go see it in the IMAX because I don't think I've ever been anywhere louder in my entire life and I spent the rest of the night with a pretty horrible headache so there you go that might have coloured my opinion on the film too but <laughs> but yeah in general I had a good time I enjoyed watching it um, it's not the most uh, I don't know it, it didn't set the room on fire but at the same time I don't think anyone was expecting it to um, and it delivered on the promises it made so if that's what you're after I think you should give it a go Honor Among Thieves wasn't at all a disappointment for me. I'd had my worries before watching, and I even tried to keep my expectations low, but it was a great time. What excites me about this is that it could be the first of many films like it, and I would love to see more. I would particularly like to see some of the other characters get more well-developed, and there's so much for them to pull from when making these films, so I doubt they'll run out of steam slash ideas anytime soon. Definitely check this out if you're a D&D fan, if you want to take your family out for a lovely day out, or both. Once again though, that's not a tiefling. Well, it sounds like we had pretty similar opinions. Yeah, I, I think. I think so. It's almost like you watched the same review. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, and it's not at all like that. It was very worth watching. I hope it adds some authenticity to our opinions so it doesn't feel like we're being 
Who skewed, buy it. Yeah, yeah. By, by a love of the game or lack thereof. Hatred. <laughs> <laughs> Pure hatred. But yeah, no, uh, thanks very much for watching this review. If you want to see more from us or if you want another review from another perspective of another person on the team, oh my gosh. you can go and find Alex Meehan's on Dicebreaker.com. There is a link in the description below and we'll have it on the end card as well. Mm. Uh, but we have loads more stuff here on youtube.com forward slash Dicebreaker, including loads of D&D stuff. Mm -hmm. We have a full D&D actual play, which is available to watch right now. Mm -hmm. um, and if you head on over to the website, there's even more on top of that, including oh, including live a membership program wow. where you can get exclusive things like if you sign up for a year, you get a whole board game for free. A There's a lot of cool stuff. Board game. A whole board a whole, game. Yeah. So head on over to that. All the links in the description below. Give us a like, give us a subscribe, and leave us a comment as well. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you on the next one. But until then, have a lovely day. Goodbye. Bye.